Hello and welcome. Welcome to what is sure to be an edifying moment. I'm Mark Sanders and I have the privilege and the honor of, of, of beginning this event. I'm the director of the Initiative on Race and Resilience and I would like to thank you and welcome you on, the par on behalf of IRR and welcome you into this space. This is the IRR Sojourner Truth Commons, and this is the first, the inaugural event in the Commons. In truth, this is a kind of soft opening of sorts in that the official opening with the donors who made this renovation possible will take place here on September 27th, a week from today, at 5.30 p.m., and all of you all are cordially invited. Global in scope and interdisciplinary and critical approach, the Initiative on Race and Resilience strives to confront systemic racism and support communities of color through a focus on research, education, and community empowerment. Equally as important, IRR works to integrate the arts in all three foci, the arts as research, a way of knowing, the arts as a mode of education, and the arts as a means of building and strengthening communities. Indeed, we can think of no better way than through the arts to keep ourselves fully alive to the critical tension at the heart of the modern concept of race, race as both a means of domination and exploitation, and race as a site of identity, resistance, and resilience. In this spirit, we are overjoyed to host Jonathan Escoffrey in this new space. On behalf of IRR, I would like to thank Professor Roy Scranton, the director of, creative, of the Creative Writing Program, for partnering, partnering with us to host this reading. We thank Asereen van der Vliet Ulumi, the director of Literatures of Exile and Annihilation, for partnering, partnering with us. We thank Paul Cunningham. Is Paul here? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Paul, would you just raise your hand? We thank Paul Cunningham, the creating writing manager, program manager, and Pauline Namalem. Pauline, are you here? Pauline was moving chairs as well. She must have just stepped out. Um, all of this would have been absolutely impossible without Paul and Pauline's help. We also want to thank Professor Dion Bremeyer for conceiving and organizing the, this event. And most importantly, we thank Jonathan Escoffrey for visiting us and christening this space with his fiction that will truly transform us. And at this point, we will hear from Professor Roy Scranton on behalf of Creative Writing. Good evening. It's so great to see this uh, room full of people up here. I'm not going to take long. I just want to take a moment to say how proud and enthusiastic we are in creative writing to welcome Jonathan Escoffrey here tonight in this space, this beautiful uh, Sojourner Truth common space, which gives concrete form to the unceasing efforts of numerous people, including most notably, of course, Mark Sanders as well as uh, members of the creative writing faculty, specifically Azarine van der Vliet Alumi, Xavier Navarro Aquino, and uh, Dion Bremeyer. Creative writing has been fortunate to collaborate closely with IRR on numerous events, and we're eager to carry that vital collaboration into the future. Several coming events offer opportunities for such collaboration, of which I'll mention two. You can find out more uh, about others on our website. First, I want to mention next Wednesday's reading with Fred Arroyo and Louisette Resto at 7.30 p.m. at the Eck Visitor Center Auditorium, celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month at Notre Dame in collaboration with Letras Latinas. So you can come here to the opening of the space and then go over there for uh, what will be a really exciting reading. And second, I want to... Um, Note our other big marquee event for the semester, the inaugural Kelly Community Reading, 
with award-winning science fiction and creative nonfiction author Sophia Samatar, which will be held at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, November 15th, uh, at the St. Joseph County Public Library uh, Central Branch. Samatar is an incredible, versatile, and, and deeply thoughtful writer, and I strongly encourage you to pick up one of her books as soon as possible and save the date for the 15th, which should be an exceptional evening. In the meantime, I'm very excited to hear from our guest and delighted to introduce my colleague, Dion Bremmeyer, who I'll mention her short story collection, The Islands, was recently longlisted for Canada's most prestigious literary award, the Scotiabank Giller Prize. Let's have a round of applause for Dion. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. Um, first, thank you to all the people who helped to bring Jonathan to South Bend, um, the Department of Africana Studies, the Initiative on Race and Resilience, and the Creative Writing Program, as well as Literatures of Annihilation, Exile, and Resistance. We want to acknowledge our presence on the traditional homelands of Native peoples, particularly the Pokagon Potawatomi, who have been using this land for thousands of years and continue to do so. We recognize our own place in the history and practices of colonialism and understand that our responsibilities extend beyond this gesture of land acknowledgement. We must also reflect on the University of Notre Dame's past, present, and future relationship with the original stewards of this land and actively pursued ways to amend this troubled resistance this troubled relationship. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, not resistance. Uh, the Literatures of Annihilation, Exile, and Resistance is an interdisciplinary research collective and lecture series that was founded by Azarine Vanderville Illumi, and it focuses on questions of human rights and the arts with an emphasis on the, on the global Middle East, Southwest Asia, and North Africa. And it's co-sponsored by the College of Arts and Letters, as well as the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies, and housed in the Initiative on Race and Resilience. So I'm so excited to have Jonathan here tonight, in part because Jamaicans are lovers of both story and language. Years ago, while talking to a friend like me, also a child of Jamaican immigrants, we bemoaned how when we went to the island, it was often to be carted around to the house of this auntie or that uncle, to be sat on a couch to talk and tell stories, or at least when we were children, to listen. It is unsurprising then that Jamaican Patois, a gorgeous combination of English African languages and a little Spanish, is a Creole rife with language that itself tells a story. One of my most favorite Jamaican expressions is, we lickle, but we talawa. There's no English co corollary for talawa, but it suggests something like, we are strong, but also we can do anything we set our minds to. And for me, I've always understood it to mean that we are fierce. The people, the island, small, but fierce. And in many ways, I believe the Talawa is the guiding principle of our culture. Our history, too, is Talawa, the near destruction of the indigenous Tainos, backbreaking sugarcane and banana plantations, colonization, slave rebellions, bauxite mining, and political upheaval. And yet, and yet, Jamaica has also been referred to as the world's least populous cultural superpower. Because Jamaica is also the birthplace of reggae music and James Bond, Harry Belafonte and Jerk Chicken, most of the world's fastest men and women, the birthplace of Garveyism, and let's not forget that Grace Jones, Malcolm Gladwell, Biggie Smalls, and Kerry Washington, and so many others all hail from the diaspora. So if you don't know, now you know. But there I go, being Jamaican, or as a Jamaican would say, boasty. What I really want to say is that not everyone has the luxury of staying where they grew up. And Jamaica's history has almost always been marked by its people being in other places. 2.8 million people in Jamaica and another 2 million in the diaspora. That, of course, doesn't count the children and grandchildren of Jamaicans. London, Miami, Atlanta, New York, Montreal, and Toronto, all home to large, thriving Jamaican communities. But we also thrive in Panama, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, Cuba, Honduras, and Australia. Talawa. What I really want to say is that when we workshop stories in class, I ask my students to avoid the word relatable as critique, because what students are often really saying is, I see my own experience reflected in the life of this character. The problem with that, of course, is that it privileges the often limiting experience of the predominantly white creative writing classroom. 
It means a story is good if its narrative reflects that of the person reading it, thereby inherently di diminishing the opportunity for the raising of other voices, of all voices. So what I really want to say is that for me, Jonathan's book is relatable, but that isn't the reason that I think If I Survive You is an important book. I've cried a few times in the past several years when finally I began seeing stories of my culture told by my people with respect and gravitas. I cried when I watched the Amazon Prime anthology Small Axe, again this summer on a bus winding its way through the burren in the Irish countryside. I cried watching a trailer for the forthcoming Bob Marley biopic. And when I read Jonathan's book, yeah, I cried. If I Survive You is not just a literary masterpiece in any sense, but it's also an important book in the way it documents, the way it breathed life into the Talawa stories of the people who live in Jamaica and into the people who live away from Jamaica and into the people who live in between both places. In an interview with Lit Hub, Jonathan said, one of the reasons I wrote this book, the reason I felt compelled to finish it, is I'd never seen a family that looks like my family in literature or on TV. And I wanted to finally see myself. Seeing yourself is important. It's a way to remember that your story matters. It's a way to remember that you may be little and you're just one person, but you are Talawa. What I really want to say is that there's something about being a child of the diaspora, something that makes us feel rootless. In the questions that animate If I Survive You, the collection, but also the first story in it. In Flux starts this way. It begins with what are you, hollered from the perimeter of your front yard when you're nine, younger probably. You'll be asked again throughout junior high and high school, then out in the world, in strip clubs, in food courts, over the phone, and at various menial jobs. The askers are expectant. They demand immediate gratification. What are you is the kind of question that will always leave you feeling homeless. Not in the literal sense, like the character Trelawney, who ends up living in his car, but homeless in the way Trelawney feels before he moves into his Dodge Raider, feeling like he doesn't belong in the land of his birth, but also like he doesn't belong in the place where his parents are from. These liminalities radiate outward from the center of the book as the characters go from relationship to relationship, from job to job, from house to house, the rootlessness of their lives, a projection of the internal reality of feelings, feeling as if you belong nowhere, of being asked so often, what are you, that you begin to ask yourself the same question, but without answer. And I'm not sure this book answers that question either, as if it could, as if it should. What it does, though, is more important and even transformative. The question becomes a clarion call that forces all of us to consider how the idea of home can transcend the idea of being rooted in place. Perhaps rootlessness itself can be a home. What I really want to say, though, is that the idea of home might itself be a conceit. And yet, it is one of the things that animates the book, that makes it an odyssey of sorts, the search for and return to home, but what if, as the book asks, home is not static and is almost always a place that exists, that can exist only in memory? Jamaica itself is always a place in flux, a place that is constantly adapting and readapting. The Jamaican national motto is out of many, one people, a motto based on the population's multiracial roots. It is African, it is European, it is Taino and Syrian, it is Chinese and Irish, and yes, English too. Yes, we Jamaicans are Talawa. We have to be. If I Survive You was nominated for more than a dozen prizes and awards internationally, including the Booker Prize, the National Book Award, the Penn Jean Stein Book Award, the Penn Robert Bingham Prize, the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence, the Aspen Words Literary Prize and the Story Prize, and was a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction, the National Book Critics Circle, John Leonard Prize, the Southern Book Prize, and was named a Best Book of 2022 by NPR, The New Yorker, Entertainment Weekly, People, Time, Oprah Daily, LA Times, The Boston Globe, The Philadelphia Inquirer, Vox, Kirkus, Book Page, Real Simple, and Literary Hub. Originally from Miami, Florida, Jonathan's the winner of the Paris Review's Plimpton Prize for Fiction, and his writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Paris Review, Oprah Daily, Electric Literature, Ziziva, American Short Fiction, and elsewhere. Please join me in welcoming my Talawa brethren, Jonathan Scoffrey.
I, I feel like I don't know if anything I do is going to live up to that, that beautiful introduction. Uh, thank you, Dion, for, for that. And for um, thank you all for, for coming out tonight. Um, my favorite thing about the introduction, honestly, is just giving you all who may not know a kind of taste for um, Jamaica and, and Jamaica's history and Jamaica's kind of cultural presence within the um, globally, to, to put it that way. Uh, my project, the project of my book as a kind of linked story collection that also operates as a novel, novel and stories, um, was to make part of that journey really personal and, and create um, a family that reflects some of the um, journey and some of the uh, values, but also some of the challenges of emigrating to uh, the US, a country like the US, or specifically to Miami, Florida. Uh, so I'm going to read from the beginning of the book from a story that's actually called Influx. And it's a story that goes on for a couple of decades within a particular character's life. I mean, you don't have to sit here for decades, <laughs> but the character, it follows him for decades uh, throughout his life. I won't go that far uh, tonight, but um, I'll just read from the, the first several pages. Um, and uh, thanks for, for, for packing the house. How much extra credit was handed out to, to get? To <laughs> All right, I'm going to start. It begins with what are you? Hollered from the perimeter of your front yard when you're nine, younger probably. You'll be asked again throughout junior high and high school, then out in the world, in strip clubs, in food courts, over the phone and at various menial jobs. The askers are expectant. They demand immediate gratification. Their question lifts you slightly off your pre-adolescent toes, tilting you, not just because you don't understand it, but because even if you did understand this question, you wouldn't yet have an answer. Perhaps it starts, perhaps it starts with, what language is your mother speaking? This might be the genesis, not because it comes first, but because at least on this occasion, you have some context for the question when it arrives. You immediately resent this question. Why does your mother talk so funny, your neighbor insists. Your mother calls to you from the front porch, has called from this perch overlooking the sloping yard since you were allowed to join the neighborhood kids and play. Always, this signals that playtime is over. Only now, shame has latched itself to the ritual. Perhaps you'd hoped no one would ever notice. Perhaps you never noticed it yourself. Perhaps you ask in shallow protest, what do you mean what language? Maybe you only think it. Ultimately, you mutter, English. She's speaking English. Before going inside, head tucked in embarrassment. In this moment, for the first time, you are ashamed of your mother, and you are ashamed of yourself for not defending her. More than to be cowardly and disloyal, though, it's shameful to be foreign. If you've learned anything during your short residence on Earth, you've learned this. It's America, and it's the 80s, and at school, in class, you pledge to one and one flag only, the stars and stripes. Greatest country on Earth is the morning anthem, it's the lesson plan, a mantra drilled into you day in, day out, a fact as inarguable as two plus two equaling four. And what you start to hear as you repeat this to yourself is the implication that all other nations, though other nations are seldom mentioned in school, are inferior. You believe this. It's an easy lesson to internalize, except that your brother Delano, your parents, nearly all your living relatives, are Jamaican. When your play cousin moves from Kingston to Miami, to your Cutler Ridge neighborhood, winding up in your third grade class, refusing to pledge allegiance to your flag, you know to distance yourself from her. You say a quiet thanks that, that your last names are different. If you'd had any context for the question of what you are when it first came, you might have answered, American. You were born in the US and you've got the paperwork to prove it. You feel pride in this fact, this inalienable status. You belt Lee Greenwood's God Bless the USA on the 4th of July, 
and even more emphatically after visiting your parents' island nation for two weeks in your ninth summer. You disagree with every aspect of the island life, down to the general lack of central air conditioning. You prefer burgers and hot dogs to jerked or curried anything. Back at home, your parents accuse you of speaking and even acting like a real Yankee. But if by Yankee they mean American, you embrace it. I speak English, you respond. Your parents' patois and what many deem an indecipherable accent still play as normal, almost unnoticeable against your ears, except that it is increasingly paired with the punitive. For instance, when your mother says, Una can spill the thing on the tile, but una can't clean it. And your brother says, no me, mommy. And you say, I didn't do it, mom. She'll say, then who did? Must be a duppy. The duppy becomes the scapegoat for all of the inexplicable activity that takes place in and outside your house. The duppy broke your mother's vase, then tried to glue it back together. The duppy hid your brother's report card underneath his mattress. The duppy possessed your father, dragged his body out for drinks after work, and didn't bring him home until morning. A duppy, or ghost, or even a grown man can be difficult to discipline, so you and your brother alone share the punishments. In school, when your world geography project is announced and you're made to choose from a list of countries to present on, you choose Mongolia. It's not till another student chooses Jamaica that you consider the tiny island a worthy option. Part of your project requires preparing a dish native to the country you've chosen. This is fourth grade. Your mothers do the cooking. When they meet one another on presentation day, eyes ring dark from having wrestled with foreign recipes late into the night. They nod imperceptibly, too exhausted for pleasantries. As your classmate begins her presentation on Jamaica, your mother sucks her teeth, a sound akin to industrial strength Velcro ripping apart, drawing glances from several of the other parents. We could have brought in leftovers, she whispers, leaning in. If only you chose home. Sorry, I'm sweating. <laughs> On career day, your father stands in front of your class and identifies himself as a general contractor. The block letter alphabet strung along the edge of the blackboard arcs over his wavy black hair. Below the arch, he unspools a foot of measuring tape with the tip of his thumb, then releases it, causing the tape to zip back into its case. The sharp whiz emitted by the swift violence of the retracted tape gains your classmates' undivided awe. Your father repeats this action several times before deigning to speak. Your classmates hold their breath in anticipation. As he explains that, when my need them bathroom fix, is me get all the plaster on PVC and ting, and is me make the work of man come nice up the place, a string of snickers breaks out from the classroom's back row. Your teacher shushes the students, but as your father continues his speech, her face crinkles, head bobbling to the beat of his patois. You concentrate on the pink surfacing over her cheeks, the color spectrum helping you determine the magnitude of this disaster. If she remains light pink, a shallow blush, a rose petal, a ballet slipper, you'll know this is a faint debasement to be forgotten in the weeks ahead. But as her skin brightens, flashing past punch, nearing violet, you recognize this as catastrophic. You question again why you didn't insist your mother come in your father's stead. She knows better how to iron out her words for American heirs, as she must every day for work. Earlier in the week, you asked her about the details of her secretarial position. From the edge of her bed, your mother explained that she works in the office of a company that ships jet engines internationally. The hem of her nightie shimmied as she skipped across the room to pull down the globe from atop your bookcase. You see here, and here, and this here? She kneeled at your bedside, pointing to Germany, then Brazil, then to the chain of Hawaiian islands, singing, we go all around the world, dancing her slender index and middle fingers across oceans and lush green continents before lifting them to tap your nose. We, you asked her. You don't get to go to these places, do you? Your mother blinked twice, then walked the globe back to its shelf. Someday, she said. 
Someday, maybe when you're all grown up. She added, better you ask your father to visit school. Him, they'll find exciting. In your fifth grade history section, you learn more about the founding of America. You learn about the subject referred to simply as slavery. It's an abbreviated watered down lesson, much like its subject heading. It's mostly good people made a big mistake. It's that was a long, long time ago. It's Honest Abe and Harriet Tubman and MLK fixed all that na nasty business. It's now we don't see race. An air of shared discomfort infiltrates the classroom during this lesson. The students agree this was a terrible event. You're mildly aware that some of your classmates are supposed to have descended from the perpetrators of this atrocity and that some descended from its victims. You're not quite aware that many descended from both. Should you feel slighted by this country you love so dearly? This is not the first time you've heard of the transatlantic slave trade as your father never misses an opportunity to denigrate your country of birth. In his boisterous version of the lesson, you learned that slavery ended in Jamaica hundreds of years before slavery ended in America. A claim you'll later learn is wrong by hundreds of years. He has a word, a Jamaican word, for black people of either nation he deems, who he deems disreputable, buto. If ever you do something that might cause him shame, he'll say, you can act like real buto sometimes. What am I, you've repeated to your mother by now. You've been asked enough times by strangers to begin seeking answers. Her response seems prepared, but not as clearly defined as the question demands. Your mother tells you that you are made up of all sorts of things. She lists countries, several countries, and assigns great-grand this and great-grand that to these many nations. Your mother rarely attaches names to these forebears, so you easily confuse them. Our last name comes from Italy, she says, by way of England. Most of the countries she lists are European, and though she's sure to add Africa as though it were a country or an afterthought, she never mentions race. You want a one-word answer. Am I black, you ask her. That, after all, is what you want to know. Race has descended upon your world, sudden and grating, and what you fear most is that others recognize in you something that you've yet to grasp. When only the kids asked, you assumed their limited experience in the world left them similarly ignorant. But now, adults are beginning to fish for answers. Some of your teachers simply gawk at you, while others ask how it is you speak so well. At first, you'll reply, I'm American, certain they are distinguishing between your accent and your parents. This answer only further confuses your teachers. Later, especially when asked by teachers whom your parents have never met, you realize they mean something else entirely. Are we black, you ask your mother. Agitation grips her. A shudder takes her bright, freckled flesh and wiggles it over her bones as she quickly finishes the family genealogy down to the last shaky detail. You stare at her blankly, noting you haven't answered the question. Her agitation infl inflates the ire. Cha, I was never asked such stupidness before coming to this country. If someone asks you, if someone asks you she says, tell them you're a little of this and a little of that. You see that her response is final. Again, she's avoided the one-word answer, what you'd hoped was a simple yes or no. The few decidedly black kids in school find you befuddling. They are among the first to insist that you state your allegiance. Are you black, they demand. You're a rather pale shade of brown, if skin color has anything to do with race. Your parents share your hue, as do their parents. Their parents, the great-grands, occupy your family's photo albums in black and white and sepia tones that conceal the color of their skin. Some look like they might have guest appeared on the Jeffersons, though, while others look like they'd sooner be cast on All in the Family. Your best school friends, Jose and Luis, are the two whose skin tones most match yours outside your home. But when they flip back and forth between English and Spanish, you feel exclu excluded. And when they flip their hair back and forth in mock headbanging motions, when singing your favorite rock songs, 
it becomes painfully apparent that yours isn't long or loose enough to bang along. Additionally, your neighbor Julie informs you that after a half a decade of friendship, you are no longer allowed to play together because your family doesn't believe in God, she says. Of course we believe in God. You know enough to respond. But she just shrugs and says, my dad says Jamaicans don't. Your mother tells you and your brother one day, oh no better no bring no nappy headed girls home. In your mother's defense, or perhaps to further disparage your mother, her list of girls not to bring home will stretch to the point where you'll wonder if she ever wants you to bring home girls. <laughs> Don't bring home no coolie, she'll start to warn in middle school. Upon seeing your uncut, coffee-colored Panamanian prom date, she'll lock herself in her bedroom. For her, your mother will have no words at all. And after you graduate, she'll say, please, please, just not a white girl. Promise me that. But this is fifth grade, and you're confused about this first warning. What, consti what constitutes nappy hair to your mother? You study hers as fine as Jose's and Luis's guitar string fibers, then study the cotton candy curls on your head. You wonder about your own hair's nappiness. You wonder who can't bring you home. So I'm going to just read one more very brief, uh, very brief part. <laughs> and I just, uh, just want to read it because it kind of speaks a little bit to um, what Dion was saying in her introduction uh, about Jamaican's cultural power, Jamaica's cultural power. Um, but then there's, there's also this kind of, I don't know, flipped, I, I don't want to give it away necessarily, but a kind of um, flipped version of Jamaica that non-Jamaicans see sometimes. And so um, as you were listening, this is the same character, Trelawney, who in a sense, he just wanted to be a, a patriotic American kid as a younger person. But as he's starting to get different messages from society, uh, people around him, he starts to reinvest in this idea of, about um, belonging to this Jamaican lineage. Um, unfortunately, he takes his pride in being Jamaican um, to a point where he believes that his parents made a big mistake by ever coming to the US. And um, he gets into an argument with his father who takes that as a very painful accusation uh, because his father and his mother know what the conditions were that made them to decide to pack up their family and, and move to the US. Um, so his father winds up kicking him out of his house, and then Chelani winds up living out of his vehicle. Um, and so I'm going to read from, it's a kind of midpoint in the book where he's finally found a full-time job again, but he's still living out of his car, and he's, um, he's trying to get back on his feet. Uh, yeah, and I'll take it from there. And I should say he's working in low-income elderly housing that's government subsidized. It might be hyperbole to say I identify with my tenants, most of whom are asylum seekers and refugees, but I can empathize well enough. My parents came to the US not for economic advancement, but to escape the violence the US government funded in Jamaica throughout the 1970s as part of its war on socialism. But when I say Jamaica to non-Jamaicans, no one thinks of CIA operatives or puppet prime ministers or historical continuity. Instead, they break into free association as if they'd been tossed into a rap cipher. Bob Marley, Irie, Ganja, Poor People, Sandals, Eman. At best, they believe our history began the moment they purchased their all-inclusive vacation package. Of course, the difference between exiles and my parents, in fact, the difference between me and my parents, is that my parents have a homeland to which they can return. Just weeks before I came home from college last year, my mother said to hell with Miami, with this whole damn country, the rat race, all of it. Let the bank foreclose on her house and dip back to Jamaica. She says she can finally breathe now, she feels freed by the privilege of relative racelessness. 
In 2009, Kingston's murder rate reached the highest ever on record, and my mom returned there so she could finally feel safe. It was my father's address I wrote on my resume and job applications. I didn't last three weeks at his house, though, before the beef got too thick to choke down, so I moved into my raider, parked in whichever lot I could find, the few left without security officers or meters, moving it incrementally to keep gas costs low and to keep from getting towed. The day I finally interviewed for this job, I filled a fast food restaurant ketchup cup with hand soap and washed myself at a South Beach shower station, the one just a block over. I aired my suit on the seawall, waiting for the sun to bake my drawers dry. You might guess the best thing about transitioning back to a paycheck is the food security, the dignity of work, or the promise of upward mobility, but it's none of these things. The best thing about a job is having a toilet on which to sit and unload your twisted, clogged up colon without having to fake like you're gonna buy that double McFuckery with fries. <laughs> and I'll stop there. <laughs> and I believe we're gonna be in conversation, so. <laughs> Uh -huh. So Jonathan and I are going to be in conversation, and then we will open up for, for questions. Um, so I love that piece that you read, too. It's, it's so um, interesting. Kind of the first thing I wanted to ask you about, which is um, work, and work's so important in this book. And maybe you could talk a little bit about like how you see work as, as important to the, the project of the book itself and, and, yeah. and telling that story. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I've always been fascinated by stories that teach me something. And um, I wanted to make sure that when it came to my stories, that when I did my research or when I brought my lived experience uh, to the page, that I didn't leave out the things that the things that I was somewhat knowledgeable about, including some of the the jobs I've had. I haven't had all of these crazy <laughs> jobs. So Trelawney, you know, he's in a, he's in some desperate spots, and so he takes on some um, some some kind of crazy jobs in order to to survive. And you know, some of them he he feels he really has to take. Some of them, I think, he gets into a kind of cycle of uh, replicating his own trauma in a sense. And, um, and, and he takes them on and, and uh, you know, hopefully they're, they're kind of, they're serious, but they're also hopefully somewhat fun to follow along on. Um, but I, I did work that job at um, a similar job at a low income elderly housing uh, complex. And it, you know, it was the kind of thing that on a day to day, I, I didn't even necessarily have the book in mind, but I, I would just kind of look up from my, my desk or my manager would tell me something and I, I would just think this is absolutely absurd that government um, subsidized housing works this way. And um, you know, the, the fact that our, our wait list was you know, literally a little composition book that we kept in the closet, the supply closet, and you know, it could go missing at any time. <laughs> there are hundreds of names, uh, if not more, uh, on, on this list and there was no real protocol for how to keep, you know, to make sure that the next person who's in line actually gets their, their apartment. Uh, because, you know, the, the building was, um, it, it was, people desperately wanted to be there and, and, and needed to be there. Um, and so I wanted to kind of highlight the absurdity of some of these, these jobs, especially the ones that are kind of government sanctioned. Uh, beyond that, from a creative standpoint, um, for me, I just don't really believe stories that, or books, that, if, if, if I can't track the money. Yeah. If characters are just kind of sitting around. But the money arrives. And the, the money, money is arrives. just there. And the food, well, you know, maybe money never really enters, but the food is there, the comfortable housing is there. Um, sometimes there's a kind of, it's less, less so in literary fiction, I find, but there's this kind of like name, name brand dropping um, so, you know, like a, there's a Birkin bag and, you know, right. on the first page of the novel for some reason or um, whatever, you know, fancy cars. But there's sometimes there, there isn't like an actual like how does this money get made, though? And if it's an interrogation of wealth or if it's an interrogation of 
um, where you, you where this money actually comes from, then to me that becomes interesting. Yeah. Um, but for for you know, I, I wasn't so much interrogating wealth from the inside anyway. Um, I was interrogating, you know, what do you do when there's no safety net and you fall through and um, and you you have to take on these odd jobs. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, most of the stories, there are, there are jobs that are being worked by uh, the main characters that are, you know, a little bit strange. And then the book is set mostly, you know, it's set in Jamaica a little bit, but primarily in Miami, Florida. And um, some crazy things happen in, in Miami. And I don't mean to, you know, exoticize my, my hometown or anything like that. Uh, but, um, you know, I wanted to show uh, some of the stories that, you know, friends of mine, like they were doing some of these jobs and, um, you know, the crazy things that would happen at work or, you know, what was expected of them on the job that might be morally compromising um, and seeing how they navigated that. I always like, some of you, are, most of you are probably too young to remember this, but the show In Living Color in the 90s, mm -hmm. do you remember they had the skit with the Jamaican of family, the Headleys? <laughs> of course. And the joke, the running joke was that they all had like seven jobs, right? And so like it's, you I have to look it up if you haven't seen it. Yeah, it's Google like, Hey uh, Mon. It was, yeah. It's it was, like the, fl the flight attendant. Yeah, and a fly the plane, and, and also, yeah, and the mechanic, the, and yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but I think that, like, that's sometimes, like, the, you know, that's that's the story of, like, the immigrants, you come here and you do whatever work, you know, there is to do to get by because, like you were saying, there's no safety net. But do you think that story is different when we think about that as, like, as part of the diaspora, like what's what changes when it's mm. like there's still no safety net and you're still having to do, you know, whatever mm. job you can to get by. Of course. And I think what's baked into the kind of narrative of the immigrant hustle um, that Jamaicans have and, and so many other immigrant populations have, I think it's, you know, I, I think it'd be, it can be a narrative that you, you use as motivation potentially, but um, I think there's an idea that there's a, a, a like the natural outcome is success at the end of it, and um, I don't know that that's reality. And so I didn't want I didn't want the book to have I you know interpret the ending of the book however you you will if you read it, um, but I didn't want it to feel like automatic like just because you you you've got this great hustle like everything is going to work out because I, I remember. Um, you know, and I also don't say, you know, despair either. <laughs> I'm not, that's not what I'm, that's not what I'm pushing here. Um, but, I, you know, I remember, so, so the, the latter parts of the book, when Chelani is an adult, he's, uh, he's trying to find work in this, you know, what's what we call the Great Recession, right? And, you know, some of the jobs that were promised to him, as long as he, he goes to college, he does well, he comes home with a 4.0. Um, but nobody cares about his English degree um, when, you know, there are no jobs, basically. Um, and the jobs that there are um, are more, more blue collar jobs. Um, but even those, you have to have a, a kind of technical know how and you have to have um, a skill, but you also have to have the experience. And so he's finding it very difficult to, uh, to, figure, to figure it out. I think, I think the difference when we were talking about the diaspora, that next generation, if I call myself like a second generation immigrant uh i didn't i didn't live in jamaica and i and i wasn't the one who made the decision to move to this this country um i didn't grow up in a place where i looked around and the doctor looked like me and the lawyer looked like me and the people in the nice houses might have looked like me um and and, and you know and and not in like a I, I, it's not that i couldn't find those people the one but you know, <laughs> the one here, the one there. But I'm talking about like the neighborhoods. Right. Like, if you're up in the hills, you know. Right. Um, you know, if you're up in Beverly Hills, or you're in, and I, mean, I don't mean California. I mean Jamaica. There's a place called Beverly Hills. Yeah. In, in Houston, yeah. <laughs> um, or you know, so many affluent places. Which again, that's another thing is that most people in the U.S. don't know that there are affluent places in in Jamaica. Um, but. If you, if you don't see that, I feel like there's a way in which, and you don't come from a strong uh, community that's telling you otherwise, uh, it, it, it can be, and your parents, on the other hand, is that your parents don't necessarily know what you're going through. In the same way, you don't know what they had to go through to get you here for you to be born. 
um, you don't, they, they don't quite understand what it's like going into an education system that's not telling your story at all, um, that's actively, depending on where you go to school, antagonistic towards um, your story and, and the story that you're growing up with or your experiences. Um, and that could be just like a really devastating thing because you may not know. I mean, a, a similar comparison, I think, though, is uh, I remember when I, I moved out of my mom's house at like 18 and I was living in low income housing and I, I was working in these crappy jobs. And it kind of went on for, for like years, like I want to say like two, three years where I mostly went to my jobs, my multiple jobs, and then I, I went home to my, like it wasn't the projects exactly, but it was like kind of the projects. Adjacent projects. Uh, definitely adjacent. adjacent. Yeah. It, it was like, uh, yeah. And, um, but it's Miami, so there's still like palm trees. But, um, and I remember like thinking like, wow, this is, this is my world and this is gonna be my world forever. Mm. And it was because I, I really hadn't, I hadn't really traveled much. I hadn't seen, after a while, I, all I saw was that environment. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, at least if I'm thinking about my parents' generation, they've seen, they've seen something else. They know there's something else out there. Um, they may have seen tough spots that made the, obviously made them um, make the decision to, to move in the first place. Uh, but I think, it's, I think it can be a different thing if, you, if all you know is, I mean, again, it's like you, um, and uh, you know, I, as a writer, I was talking about this earlier in your class, thinking about where you, where you point the focus, like the lens of your stories is, is kind of important. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, humor, and someone told me earlier before we started that the book's funny. Um, I, I think it's important to have a kind of levity and um, bring you know, energy in the prose and a kind of joy, and you know, I don't think this is, um, I'm trying to avoid the, the phrase, but like like a like a poverty porn kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not it's 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 not that, um, but I think it's grappling with realities that you know a lot of people are facing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about like Miami? And I think that um, I think much like you know Jamaica is, is defamiliarized for people in the in the book. I think Miami is too, right? That it's mm -hmm. not. Slick and polished. It's not South Beach, right? The Miami mm -hmm. that you see in your novel. It's a much more complex and, and complicated place. And, right. and how do you see that as, as sort of central to the, the work of the book? Yeah, so much of Miami is not. I mean, there's literally Miami Beach is literally a different city from, from Miami. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so we all know like you know, sports fans like the, the Bron LeBron James said, you know, taking my, <laughs> my talents to Miami Beach. And it's like. <laughs> Like maybe like a different kind of talent, but you're playing basketball <laughs> in a different city. It's yeah. in the city of Miami. Um, I, I I really just wanted to, and you know the the story, the the second story I read from, it takes place on South Beach, but it's so even South Beach isn't South Beach. Right. You know what I mean? Like it's like if you watch, I love these movies too. You know, ba Will Smith and uh, Martin <laughs> <laughs> Lawrence, Bad Boys, the the, yeah. the series. Right? I mean. I, it's so fun to see Miami in, 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 in these different ways, um, uh, and, and I just mean visually seeing it, but the, the, just the constant flash, um, that, I'm not, it does exist, but that's not the only side of it, and it's such yeah. a small side of it, and Ocean Drive is literally one street <laughs> in this entire, <laughs> you know, Miami-Dade County with millions of people, it's like that's one street that they always show. And so I show Collins where that was taken. That's that story's told on Collins Ave, and it's the very next street over. And again, you've got all these people who are who are living in poverty there, and who their concerns aren't, you know, spinning the block in a Lamborghini. You know, it's survival. Um, but then I also wanted to tell the, you know, stories that were take, taking place in um, some of the other. I mean, some of it takes place in, in downtown Miami, like the Brickell area, but some of it is in the suburbs. And I, I didn't want, you know, I, it's like, it's not always sexy to, to set a book in the, in the <laughs> suburbs, um, you know. And if you want people to read your book, you've got to sell the book somehow. But, uh, you know, I, so, you know, but this, this family, that's where, that's where I grew up. And when I grew up in the suburbs, I didn't even know I was growing up in the suburbs. I just thought I was, I was just, I was just Miami, you know, <laughs> but um, I wanted to I wanted to talk about those those 
I mean, what might be thought of as the, the outer reaches where um, people are, you know, if you can have a successful tree service um, in Miami, you know, you might move to, <laughs> to, 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 you might be flashy on Ocean Drive because um, that's the kind of job that, you know, can make a lot of money. And that's the kind, but there's, you're, you're also liable to um, face dangerous situations and you're also liable to have your business fail, especially if it's around um, something like a recession. Absolutely. Yeah. I read an interview where you were talking about how a lot of the stories started off as essays and you decided mm -hmm. to make them into to fiction that, that gave you a little bit more freedom. Like what, mm -hmm. you don't have to spell out what was, was true and not, but maybe you could talk a little bit about like where you feel like fiction gave you more of an opportunity to tell some of the stories that you wanted to tell in the way that maybe the, the essay form felt limiting or, or felt like mm -hmm. it didn't give you the opportunity to tell some of those stories. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think we, we talk sometimes about emotional truth and getting to that. And sometimes it's like, I can know something, I can feel something emotionally true because of uh, a series of events that have happened in my life, but it may have started at 12 years old and then, you know, something else may have happened at 30 and then something at 40. And that's like disjointed in a way to try to tell, like to write an essay in yeah. that kind of way. Um, it might not make sense. And so compressing time, that's an opportunity that, that fiction can create for you. Um, similarly, you, you might hear, there might be lines of dialogue that are attributed to a particular character, but maybe you're hearing that from so many different people in your life. Um, so creating character out of um, a particular uh, power dynamic, for instance, that maybe you've experienced over and over. Um, but creating, to, I mean, I don't know, I, I feel the most human when I'm reading great fiction and also when I'm creating what I think is, I won't even say great fiction, but what I'm, I'm connecting with when I have like flow, yeah. you know, when I'm showing up on, you know, um, and my thoughts are focused and um, I'm expressing um, a particular uh, idea in a way that, that feels like maybe, maybe I'll be, further understood if someone else were to, to read that, yeah. or maybe other people will be further understood if, if, if they were to read it. Um, I feel that the most when it's dramatized. Mm. And, um, and it's kind of ironic I say that because some of the stories are, especially some of these longer, some of the stories that take place over the course of decades, um, I was, as I was telling your class earlier, I, I often I, I skip the description of the room. <laughs> I'm, I'm not necessarily super interested always in setting up, you know, a slowly built scene. It's more like let's get to let's let's get to the the tension points between characters, mm -hmm. and let's get to the the, the conflict that um, that arises uh, in a given in a given um, circumstance. And um, again, I don't know, fiction just, just speaks to me. There's also, you know, there's like the bravery factor of you can hide behind fiction. You got to get to the truth still. But, you know, you can, you can create characters so you, you don't necessarily confront um, specific people in your, 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 your life. Because sometimes the idea is to get your greater point to the, the world across. It's not to say you know, mommy, daddy, you, you hurt me, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, it's not to like point the finger. I, I, I think that's, I mean, if that's the engine of your creation, I think you can use pettiness in that way. But once you, <laughs> once you, step, you know, once it's created as a draft and you go back and you revise and you really think it through and you really figure out, okay, what is it I'm trying to say again? Um, I think there's a level of thoughtfulness you, you tend to bring to it if you're making it, you know, worthwhile. Um, that has to go beyond the pointing the finger, I yeah. think. Although that's part of our cultural legacy, pettiness, right? That's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, I was really struck by something you said today um, in, in my class and that resonated with me, which was thinking about sort of maybe not telling the stories of like Jamaicans and telling the stories of the diaspora at first and, and trying to sort of write other kinds of stories. And, mm -hmm. and I, 
I think I had a very similar experience in story writing is that I sort of avoided writing those stories and, and yeah. came to it a little bit at a time, but that, that changed, opened up my writing for me. And maybe yeah. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about like how you kind of started to do that and, and, and what that changed for you in your, in your writing process and, and in mm. the process of creation. Yeah, it changed everything for me. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if, if anyone here hasn't read um, Langston Hughes' Uh, the essay, the I, I might get it backwards, and someone here will correct me. But the racial, the the Negro artist and the racial mountain. Um, I, I, I took a Harlem Renaissance class as an undergrad, um, but I was again. I kind of explained what I was going through with all the jobs and um, my my living conditions, and so I, I returned to school kind of uh, later, around twenty five, um, and. What I love about that is that I saw the value. I, I really, really saw the value in a education, and it was beyond for me personally. It was well beyond um, any promise of a job. It was like I knew I needed to grow as a human being. Uh, but thankfully, there was this, and that's the whole you know education. Um, my my undergraduate experience did a lot for me, but I wound up in this. Uh, Harlem Renaissance class, and I read that essay, and that for me had I, I'd wanted to be a writer for a really long time um, since I was you know under ten years old, uh, but at a certain point, as my kind of awareness of race and racism and culture and all these different questions started to arise, I I I noticed that most of what I'd been reading, most of what had been assigned to me. Most of what I, you know, I, I was judging books by their covers. So I was, you know, when my mom would give me an allowance to go to the bookstore, I would just pick whatever cover looked cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's that leads me to like fighting with my publisher about covers. And I, actually, I like my cover, but I, I fought. <laughs> I fought for it. Um, but uh, I hadn't really been reading anything where it was. It was like well. This character who desires something, or or maybe this character who's trying to get out of a tough situation, um, is also grappling with the fact that the kind of body that you walk around with for all of your life has some impact, if not a large, major impact on on your experiences and how you experience things, um, and 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 almost almost none of what I'd been reading outside of college had had been grappling with that or had been creating protagonists and narrators who were grappling with that and so reading that and so for me it was kind of like and then when i it was like when i heard about black authors it was almost like hearing about them without actually reading their work mm. and so there was this kind of idea of but i want to be a great author i don't want to be <laughs> like i don't want to be on just one bookshelf in the back of the bookstore, right. you know, that might, it might get attention on, it gets moved up uh, in February, you know, gets, <laughs> um, I wanted to just be, you know, the, the, uh, a really great writer. And, um, but that, that, that essay broke down for me, my, my, my misunderstanding of the situation in a sense, mm -hmm. which is for me to actually connect with my lived experience and my humanity and like the fullness of who I am, I have to grapple with my race and, and all these other questions about my my identity um, and skirting around that wasn't going to to get me there and then I also had a track record of stories that I'd written that <laughs> they just felt so fake it was there were poor representations or poor copies poor mm -hmm. ripoffs of what I had already read mm -hmm. that had nothing to do with my my life um, or even really what I was necessarily interested in um, and so I started writing more about, uh, and I kind of, you know, I kind of stumbled into it in a, a fit of pettiness and frustration, I think, <laughs> <laughs> where I, I started writing about um, this pair of, of uh, Jamaican American brothers. And, um, but I, I'll say I at least had, in terms of pettiness, I at least had the awareness, because it was a story where Trelawney essentially is complaining about Delano not paying the rent that, you know, in the house that they share. And, um, but I had a kind of awareness like, oh, but you're kind of a jerk in the way that you're complaining about you're him. Right. And I'll, I'll at least give my younger self that, that credit that I had to acknowledge if you're, gonna, if, you're, if you're gonna write stories where again, you're like pointing the finger, there's always so many, there's multiple sides to it. Mm -hmm. And um, understanding that 
you know, was in a sense part of that breakthrough of what, um, you know, what's, what's, what's Trelawney's role in his own uh, hardships. Yeah. Um, as much as, you know, society plays a part, as, long, as much as his family is playing a part, what, what, what's his responsibility to, to do better by himself? And I love that so much about the collection that's got this kind of funhouse mirror quality to it where like you come in, you've, you're very empathetic with his story and then you really see Trelawney being a jerk in another mm -hmm. way and you get Topper's story and he's very empathetic towards that story and it's constantly, you know, shifting in terms of how you feel about the character. But I love that so much because that's, that's people, right? And we I constantly so. shift how we, how we feel about them. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's such a, such a cool thing with, with the collection. Um, I'm just going to ask one last question, and I'll let you guys ask questions. Um, but I think that there is such um, an interesting quality where there are these kind of decisions that the characters make, but they're also hemmed in like by their circumstance, right? And mm -hmm. Matthew Celestes talks about this in his book, Craft in the Real World, um, this idea that sort of limitless choices is, is kind of a privilege, right, for characters. And they are for characters who don't have to worry about money and race and class. And, and I wonder how, like you see your characters working where there's, there are these forces, there's political forces that cause people to leave Jamaica, there's hurricanes, right? Those yeah. things that are beyond the control of, of characters of color and how that, how that shapes your, your storytelling. Yeah, yeah. Um, right, I wanted to contend with those major factors. And it's a way, so Ch Chilani, uh, I, I don't know why I, I want to start here, but my, my, one of my bigger failings as a writer is that I'm not great with, um, keeping like time or understanding what age a character is supposed to be, you know, and what that means for, for their, their, their life. And so for me, Trelawney had to be born in, in 1980 because, because I was born in 1980 <laughs> and I know where I was. I know what happens in like two, th and I think especially when you have that round number, it's yeah. like, I, you know, I know what happened in 92 with Hurricane Andrew and I know Hurricane Katrina in 2005 and I, I know these things based on just like my own kind of brain timeline um, I wanted to bring in those those um, kind of larger kind of um, global or national events um, to think about how these characters would be how people in general would be responding and, and you know and the, I, the, I think the biggest um, final um, kind of event like that again is, is the recession and um, where you have this you have this bright guy Trelawney who's um, in his words he, he faithfully followed the upward mobility playbook mm. and he did that only to wind up an extraordinary failure failure mm -hmm. um, and he's he's um, I, th I think Notre Dame is actually mentioned in the book where he, <laughs> he's, he's living out of his vehicle and he's you know he's trying to He's trying to sleep. He's trying not to bake because it's Florida and it's 100 degrees. Um, and he is trying to find work on Craigslist. Um, and he, he's, been a, he's been dodging security guards for like a day or two now, a, a day or two, but they finally catch up with him. And the person who catches up with him went to high school with him. And it's a guy that he kind of like vaguely remembers. Um, and, and the guard asks, you know, I thought you went to somewhere like really great, like Notre Dame or, <laughs> you know, or, you know, some other kind of fancy university, like what happened? And he says, graduation, you know, this is, this is, this is what I got for my, my 2008, 2009. He didn't go to Notre Dame, by the way, <laughs> but um, yeah, he's, he's landed in this, in this really hard spot. And, uh, you know, part like the humor in the book is a lot of it is the fact that comes from the fact that that's that's kind of his only weapon against these harder situations that um, that he didn't cause the ones that he didn't cause and the ones that are, you know, the, the, the tough stuff of, of life. Some of it is weather events, of course, weather events are also impacted by what we're doing yeah. to cause, you know, global uh, climate catastrophes and, and all of that. Um, and then those other systemic um, sources of, of oppression uh, are also are also at play. But he, what does he do? He 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 chooses a job. I mean, the job, the only job he he can find is a job that I, I almost don't even want to say. <laughs> I feel like I might catch on fire if I describe the job. But he shows up <laughs> to um, a woman's house who wants him to to do some crazy stuff, 
And he, he, he but the only caveat, like the, or the, the constraint, is that um, he's not supposed to show up if he's black. And he's like, well, I'm going to show up anyway and ask her to prove it. <laughs> 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 and, um, and so that's, you know, that's how he is facing these kinds of, because yeah. he can't beat racism. No. And he can't beat, you know, he could wait out if he had the, 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 the again, the safety net. He could wait out the recession maybe. But, um, you know, these things are larger than him. And so he has to just approach it with a kind of fortitude and a sense of humor. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to open up for questions. There's a mic up here, and is there one in the back also, or there's one there? Okay, so if you guys want to come to the mic to ask Jonathan questions. No questions? I can keep going, I mean. Oh, there's some questions on the... Uh, we do have a question on the chat. If okay. You want me to read that? Sure. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Ursula would like to know whether you considered writing a chapter from the perspective of the mother, and if so, why might you have decided against that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I tried and tried. So I had a, I had a, per, I had a story written from the perspective of not Sonia, who's the mother in the book, but from Jelly, who is Chelani's girlfriend at the end of the book. And it was, it was a story I, I workshopped a couple times. Um, I, I, I was working on the book, the, you know, the earlier version of the book since my MFA. So I'm, try, I'm trying to face you all, but <laughs> be, be in the microphone. Um, <laughs> And I, I had this wonderful experience with it where, so it's written from her perspective, and she's, she's also living in this house with these brothers, and they're not getting along, the brothers, I mean. Um, and it was, this, 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 it was one of my best workshops ever, um, and the workshop was most, it was mostly women in the workshop, and um, they were telling me, this is like the best thing you've brought in so far. And, and my, mind you, this is still a, it's a long time ago, so I, I hope I've written a better story <laughs> since then, but including in the book. But um, it was outside of my experience, and it was a, it was a Cuban-American woman, for one thing. Um, and I brought it to another workshop because I'm like, man, I don't know, I don't know if I'm... I don't, I don't know if I feel comfortable with this, even though it's, it's like I wanted to represent the multiculturalism of Miami. Um, and at the same time, it was kind of like, I don't know that I have the right to, especially from like a first person point of view, mm. to kind of step into these shoes. But I, I brought it into uh, another, another workshop, um, or it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a workshop, but like a, a writing group. And, um, and a good friend of mine who I love, he's like wonderfully blunt, he's just like, uh, he'd read the whole book and he was like, yeah, just get rid of that, 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 that crap that you thought you were getting to get away with. <laughs> <laughs> and he's my, 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 my Cuban uh, homie. He's just like, nah, can't, can't do it. Um, and I, I'm not even saying that like the right decision necessarily rests on exactly like the, the equations that I came up with and the conclusions I came up with. But I tried to write, and I think it would have been a different scenario writing a Sonya story. I, I was working on a Sonya story and, and working and working. And it, I didn't even quite get to the end before I realized like this doesn't feel as real as everything else I'd written in the book. Mm. And I think it's because like nobody can walk in this room right now and tell me they know more about what it is to be a Jamaican American man in this country and growing up in Miami kind of thing. And I, I just felt like I stepped so like fully into the embodiment of, of these characters that I'd, I'd written, the, uh, the male characters in, in the book. Um, so, you know, I'm often critical of myself, so I could say it's a failure of imagination. <laughs> but at the same time, you could read that, that Sonia story and be like, and no matter what I wrote, you could just be like, Jonathan, nah. <laughs> you know? and, I, and, uh, and to me, I don't know, like I want, I almost want to write a whole novel from Sonia's uh, point of mm. view. And I have so much notes like sketched out and all this stuff. But I, I think, I don't think every book has to be like so 
you know, like so to the skin, like this is what I lived kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and with, you know, 99% of the book already being that, it, it just, it was very difficult to kind of now cram in a, Son a Sonya story that would have felt like, like a tokenism kind of mm. thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hello, thank you for being here. Uh, my first question is, how would you characterize the relationship of your characters um, to Latino characters, and not just Cubans, but also Central Americans, South Americans, uh, Caribbean Latinos? And then my second question is, uh, what sort of influence um, has the Spanish language had on your work? Because a lot of people in Miami, they speak Spanish mostly, predominantly, and, and I assume maybe you know, you've had people speaking Spanish to you, right? Um, yeah. So those are my two questions. Thank you. Yeah. Um I'll start with the I'll start with the second question just because when I was looking for influences, um, and I, I said this earlier today, the formally the kind of novel and stories or very closely linked story collection form, the the story that can operate as a, a chapter that builds into something bigger until you have this larger arc. Um, you know, it was, it was Sandra Cisneros's uh, The House on Mango Street. That was the first thing that I came across. I was like, this, this is it. This is what I want to do. This is the form that I want to take. Um, you know, then right around the time I was applying to grad school, I started learning who Juno Diaz was. I was looking for Miami books. I was looking for Jamaican books in Miami, and I wasn't finding them. But I was finding books like Janine Capo Crusette's uh, How to Leave Hialeah. Um, uh, I was reading uh, um, in Cuba, I was a German Shepherd, um, which partially takes place in Cuba, partially in Miami. Um, and they, were, they felt like so, like these authors were owning their versions of Miami in a way that I, I just absolutely loved. And I felt like, again, like that's what I want to do. And it felt like kind of, again, I'm moving closer geographically to where um, the city that I wanted to write about, I mean, because that's, that's where I wanted to, again, it's like I wanted to, it's, it's not that I wanted to correct the, the image of Ocean Drive and South Beach, but it's like, there's more to it. And these other authors, these Latinx authors were, were, were showing that there's more already. And I wanted, so I wanted to dip into my, yeah. my kind of side of that. Um, for the first part of the question, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting thing. If you're growing up in Miami, the, the majority vastly is uh, a Latinx population. Um, and as, as uh, the person who asked the question said, the, it goes, the population, the diversity, um, it's, it's way more diverse than just the Cuban population, which people tend to talk about when, when we're talking about Miami. Um, so for, for me, I had to have um, characters who were from these various populations in the book. It felt, I've, I've read the books, and I'll, I'll say this even as a kind of, I've, I've sometimes been disappointed when I, I read about, I'll say about places where I know there's like a big po black population <laughs> and somehow like there's no, and I'm not saying they need to be like the main characters or the protagonist or any of that, but I'm just like somehow part of the texture, you just like carve these, this whole community out. Yeah. And for me, it, 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 it would have been so fake to, to, to do that. Um, and so that's where, you know, I, I do have some Spanish in the book. I have characters speaking Spanish in the book. Um, I, I studied Spanish, but I'm not a fluent Spanish speaker. So depending on my my uh, friends who are native Spanish speakers to, to help me out <laughs> uh, and, you know, really depending on them, uh, that was a big part of the project. Other questions? Yeah. Everyone's afraid of this front microphone, huh? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm like standing in the back. Thank you so much for reading. I lo loved it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so as a white girl who grew up in the suburbs, your passage about Bob Marley and the sandals, I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so yeah, just hit true. <laughs> um, the thing that I loved about uh, the, your reading the most um, was your specificity of details, like the zoning in on those particularities just the everyday details.
details. It reminded me a lot of the, but the everyday details that translated into that universal or more, I guess, more collective experience and some of the points that you were trying to get across as a writer about social milieus and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just wondering uh, if you could like kind of talk a little bit about how you make those decisions creatively about which details to include um, to, to not only illustrate the true depth of the characters, um, but to also illustrate the larger societal or socioeconomic points that you're trying to get across. Oh. Thank you for that question. Yeah, um, I mean, sometimes I, I stumble upon them. Uh, as I know I, I mentioned, I, I don't want to. I don't want to describe everything in a, in, in a room that my characters are are, you know, fighting within, arguing within, living in. Um, but figuring out the significant detail and what can um, what co what can come into play in in various ways. They they might eventually make their way into a, a kind of plot point, such as um, in the penultimate story in, in the book, um, there's a, a couple of guys, one of the, the older brother, he has a tree service, but it's, you know, it's like defunct basically, and his business partner tells him that since a hurricane's about to make landfall, they should try to get the, the business back on track, but the only problem is that their bucket truck has been, uh, it's, in the, it's in a mechanic's yard because they haven't, they don't have the money to pay for it, to uh, get out, like for the for the repairs, um, and but he tells them, you know, what you do is you go in with a, you take this green apple, the sour apple, and you go in, and when you know you're feeling nervous, you bite into the apple, and that's gonna that's gonna give you this like kind of screwed up face where you look intimidating, and of course it's a, it's an absurd plan, <laughs> <laughs> but he he does take the apple in and he does try it and it's not working out, um, but he then like uses. I won't even get into like the how, but he kind of uses the apple to steal his truck back. Um, and so it becomes like a part of the of the plot. But I wanted it to kind of demonstrate. Um, I mean, in this in this case, I felt kind of positive in that scene in the story that, you know, even though there's this kind of power difference, there's this economic power difference. Um, Rusty, who's the mechanic, he, he literally has a gun. We, we come to learn. Um, but he's rumored to have a gun anyway. Uh, and I, I wanted to, in a way, like be creative on the page. Because sometimes you know, we, we talk about representation and we talk about all these things that are so important. But also I'm a fiction writer and I want to be, you know, I want to come up with scenarios that are, uh, that are creative and that are imaginative. And so I thought, well, if he goes in with this apple, like how does he... How does he use that as, as a weapon against someone who's, who's, who's carrying a Glock or whatever? Um, but again, like trying to figure out like what's the, how, how might I represent that power imbalance um, can be, can be the, the thing. And then sometimes I write just very um, kind of organically, like um, writing from the subconscious almost, and I'll write three pages of something and maybe it's not even good, but I think, okay, I've got three pages. I'm happy about that. I don't know where to go now. I don't know where to go next. And so I'll bring back a detail that already appeared on that first page because I, I think, well, clearly I was kind of interested in that. So how can I bring it back and expand it and make it, um, you know, it seems kind of incidental at first. It seems inconsequential. Um, how do I give it weight by bringing it back? And so, like I was reading about the duppy. And I think right around where I left off, it's like I bring the duppy back and it's like the duppy returns more mischievous than ever. He takes your father through a, a bacchanal, uh, a this, a that, you know, and you don't see him for days. And so it's like every time this duppy is appearing, we, we start to relate it to the father's bad behavior or really he's being, you know, he's being a bad father. He's being a bad husband, really. Um, and um, so growing those details in ways that are, it's like anytime you can get it, make a detail, do multiple things, you know, do um, the, the, the work of bringing that cultural reference back, but also talking about um, how this family is operating, especially with the father in that, you know, that particular moment uh, can, be, can be a good idea <laughs> for the writers out there. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Jonathan. Let's thank Jonathan. Thank